night. Yeah, yeah this is real stuff now. <laughs> John doesn't let us take a break. He just wants no, to work no, all the time. Good. It's well, the worst. good news is John must be working all the time. That's good. I like that. <laughs> just give another Tony. minute. Uh, I'm not sure we have the wise chair yet to join. I believe the chair may not be able to make it. Okay. Need some leadership. Need the vice chair here. Yep. Let's find her. All right. Evening, Gary. Hi, Tony. Uh, let me just get some water. Um, if it's going to be like that, maybe I'll go get some wine. I don't know. Hey, John, I'm going to turn my screen off and tell uh, my item. Okay. Hi, everyone. There's Martha. Looks like we have most everyone. Hi, John. Did, did Were people not going to join us tonight? Uh, just the chair, I believe. Uh, he, he is away. Okay. All right. So... Martha's here. Yeah. We can start. Everyone, yeah. Everyone's here. Yeah. So, John, you want to go ahead, starting with the agenda? Yeah, so uh, we'll establish quorum first. Uh, Vice Chair McClatchy. Here. Commissioner Claris. Here. Free. Here. Colbeck. Here. Richmond. Here. Whipple. Here. So we have a quorum. Uh, would the Vice Chair lead us into the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Yes, everyone. I pledge allegiance pledge to the flag, to the flag of the United States of America, America, America and to the Republic, 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 Republic for which it stands, stand, one, nation, one nation under God, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, liberty and justice, for, all. justice for, all. for all. Okay, so uh, we would move to public comment for items not on the agenda. Would any members of the public like to comment on items not on the agenda today? Hello, I just raised my hand. I see two hands. Uh, we'll have Roberta speak first. Hi, good evening, gentlemen. Can you hear me? And, and Martha? Yes. 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 Uh, so I, I did actually, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about the state of our finances and the fact that we sort of don't have our arms around where we are yet. And, and I certainly want to be patient with you guys. Um, but it concerns me because I think this is a good opportunity for uh, you guys to somehow communicate with the city council members and give them an education on where we are now, what we're capable of doing. Kaljeet spoke at the, when the commissioners met with the city council and basically said, you know, we don't have any money for the CIPs for the next two years. And, uh, you know, I hope that you do take the opportunity, like I said, to uh, work with John and welcome John to the city uh, and together to educate ca the council and the um, the community on what we can do that's reasonable and what we can't do. The second thing I want to talk about just real briefly was uh, Anthony Tanaseka was kind enough to send me the link to our sales tax revenue. And I know that there's an issue now with uh, people asking for a theater downtown. And I thought it was very, very interesting to look at our revenues uh, as far as sales tax. And actually the majority of our revenues come from places that are not downtown, like BevMo and uh, El Camino 76 and Lucky Supermarket and Rite Aid and Whole Food Markets and Trader Joe's and uh, let's see, some, some others. And, you know, perhaps you guys working along with Anthony and John can help, you know, the city increase the revenues that they're getting from sales tax by seeing what's working, what's not working. The, the restaurants are certainly not uh, producing a lot of revenue for the city. And I think we should put our efforts where we can be successful. So thank you very much. I hope that you know that 
you know, the residents are watching, we're waiting patiently, and uh, we're glad that you're paying some of the CalPERS because we really, really do need essential services to be provided, police, et cetera. And, you know, whether you like the theater or don't like the theater, when they're asking for $50,000 for a feasibility study, I was thinking, gee, that could pay for one of the police cars that we have on our CIP. You know, we can't have policemen breaking down in the cars. But it could be whatever you prefer, and I know you're not gonna tell council what to do, but I do really think that they do need an education on where we stand now, what we're able to do, and what is reasonable to do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roberta. Is there anyone else? We have another speaker, Terry Couture. Hi, city, uh, hi, city financial planners and city uh, financial manager. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Yeah. yes. I wanted to thank the financial committee for all the hard work they've been doing the last couple of years under COVID. And I, like Roberta and so many other people in the city of Los Altos, I'm very concerned about the financial future of Los Altos. I'm concerned that some people think that there's gonna be some money coming in that's gonna be free and used for things that could be frivolous. And we have so many things that we need to take care of. And I'm counting on this team to help the new finance manager and the new city manager to keep us all in good shape and not turn us into Rome. So thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. And uh, for the benefit of the commission members, there was a written comment as well, which I had posted with the agenda. So I read it. Uh, is there a, did it come unsigned or was it from somebody specific? It was from Terry. Okay, thank you. So we would move on to uh, the minutes of the prior meeting and take a vote on that. Do you want me to share the minutes on the screen or would you like to take a vote? Um, so I just had one comment. Was was Kaljeet a yes or was he an absent? But he was uh, he was an absent in the last meeting. Yeah, he was absent last meeting. Okay. So, uh, can you on item number one, the approval of uh, of the minutes? He should be not a yes, but an absent. I believe on the minutes I have him as absent, uh, chair as absent. Uh, Let's see, <clears throat> the meeting minutes by the following A's curse. Okay. I'll try yeah, it's in conflict. You have eyes. Um, you have one, and then below it, you have absent. So oh, yes. just be okay. I will make that um, correction. So do we move to approve move that? approval? Uh, move approval as corrected. Second. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. I'll take the roll. Vice Chair McClatchy. Yes. Commissioner Claras. Yes. Three. Yes. Solbeck? Yes. Richmond? Yes. Lupin? Yes. Motion passes six to none with uh, the chair absent. So we'll move on to item number two, and uh, that's for the OPEB uh, reserve. Uh, I'm going to share my screen on this one. Uh, and pull up the presentation. Are you able to see my, my screen? Yes. Great. So we have uh, a Servit fund with CalPERS, uh, and the last valuation here was based on first of 
January 2019. Uh, we should have had a new valuation in the beginning of 21, but I think because of uh, the lack of staff, it wasn't done. So we will have a new one in 22 that could change these numbers significantly. However, uh, the 20, uh, 20 numbers were rolled forward on this one. So as you would see here, the present value of the benefits is around 5 million and our OPEP liability uh, is 3.6, while our assets are a million nine eighty two for a net liability of a million six hundred. Mr. Furtado, are you intending uh, that we see something other than your title slide? Because right now your yeah, title look, slide is what's up. Yeah, can you maximize the presentation? So I, I don't I'll see. just scroll down to the next slide. Yeah, that'll do it. That's good. Yeah. Okay, are you seeing the second slide now? The OPEB well yes. report summary? Yes. Yep. Okay, so it was sharing the wrong screen. Sorry about that. So based on this data here that I've just marked, uh, we have a funded status of 55%. Uh, when these valuations were done, we invested this money in 2016. Uh, they were actually proposed annual contributions to be made to the fund, which were not made. Uh, in exchange, what we actually did was we funded the reserve instead of funding the fund itself. And that's what accumulated the 1.5 million. So what we are looking at today is if we put in the one and a half million back into this trust, uh, we should be around 96.5% funded. And I'll move to the next slide. So here was our initial contribution in 2016 for a million five hundred. And the investment earnings on that one and a half million was almost 1.1 million here for a total of 2.6, 2 which means we made a 10.8% 10, 10 return in the five years that we put it on an annualized basis. Moving on to each of the years, here you would see the performance over, over time and the cumulative returns. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this slide. And then here's our actual funded status. In 2014, we were not funded at all. In 2017, we were 51% funded. In 2019, which was the last valuation that was done, we were 56% funded. And that funding ratio has now dropped to 55%. Now, with regards to where we are invested, uh, the CalPERS circuit has got three investment strategies uh, going from the most risky to the least risky. Uh, we are invested in strategy one, and that is something to think about uh, today. Uh, the strategy one has an expected return, as you see, of 7.5% with a risk of 11.3%, 11.8%, while the strategy two has a slightly lower risk and strategy three is the most, is the least risky. And here's the benchmark against how they are performing. Uh, global equities have performed well. So uh, having invested in strategy one has paid off for us so far. Uh, but it is more risky. And it's something to think about as we go forward, whether we want to continue in strategy one, two, or three. I know a lot of cities that uh, are poorly funded continue to take that risk in strategy one. Those who are better funded are moving to two and three. And this is just an analysis of how their returns have performed. And how much do we pay for this? We we pay 10 basis points to invest in this uh, strategy with, uh, with the CERBIT. And what you see on the other end, that, that's in relation to the Section 115 Trust for Pensions, which we are not looking at today. 
So this is just an analysis of how many people are participating in the survey. There are 588 agencies that participate in it. And the question for us today is, we do have a 1.5 million lying in the trust, or, or rather in the fund balances, do we want to move that uh, to this fund? That's the first question that I would be asking the committee. And the second question would be whether we want to continue for the time being in the current strategy. Uh, I believe after moving one and a half million will be almost 96% funded. Uh, my personal opinion would be that uh, we also need to look at ongoing funding, whether we need to be doing that on an annual basis from our operating budget. Uh, more likely than not, since we are 96.5% funded uh, and we have a three-year-old valuation, I would rather wait for a new valuation, uh, which would be 1-1-2022, one, one, which we would receive by the close of FY22 on the 30th of June, 2022. And we could take a call at that time, looking at our uh, numbers and seeing what is our unfunded liability at that point to decide whether we need to have ongoing funding. And with that, uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. I guess I'll start with a, with a question for the committee. Um, I've been on the, the committee for two or three years now. And as far as I can determine, we have always been in favor of making this contribution, that it's kind of a no brainer relative to alternative investment returns. And yet after all that dialogue and several years, we haven't done it yet. Uh, so to the other members, is there something that I'm not, that I'm missing within the committee or within the administration that doesn't want to do this? I, I know it's kind of an open-ended question, but it would be relevant if we make this contribution and then we turn over to maybe future contributions. So, so I'm, I'm the new kid on the block here, but I have exactly the same reaction that why haven't we done this before? Uh, so I'm obviously missing the, uh, the historical context, but this seems to be a no brainer, as you said, to, to make these and to stay, uh, stay at close to 100%. Uh, so what is this money eventually used for? This is actually to pay pensions of our, of our employees. What, what is it? No, this is non-pension. Okay, so this comes, so where's it gonna go at some point? Yeah, so John needs to answer. This is basically, John, just can we level set? Cause I'm kind of where Mark was. This is the first peep I've ever heard that a funding stream hasn't been made in lieu of just parking the money in this reserve account. So that's completely new to me. So maybe start with a couple of questions. The deck said, and I don't have it in front of me, um, there's two, like 256 lives in this program. So a couple of questions, is this program frozen or are people, are, are new employees newly allowed to be eligible for OPEB um, benefits in the course of their employment? My understanding is that it's frozen. It's uh, for old and existing employees be before a certain date. Right, okay. Um, so the, the 256 lives covered by it's not gonna go up, it's gonna go down. It could go up depending on how many more people retire from the eligible criteria, unless unless that's the total. I, I have to go back and look at the slide. Okay. You are right. It won't change. And then my, my next question is, whose obligation is it to fund their health care? Did, did we lay that off the CalPERS or does somebody else administer that obligation? Because just for the, make sure we're all level set. Th this is, uh, my guess is this is almost exclusively post-employment health care benefits to employees who got in under the wire and are either vested into it or you're saying there may be still people on the rolls who are eligible to vest into this benefit. Cor correct. And it is okay. the liability of the city. Uh, we, we have to pay it annually. So we pay an ongoing portion and uh, at some point, 
the total liability that's shown, once we meet that liability, rather than contributing it from our operating budget, it would be contributed through the fund. So, so it would meet our obligations for the future. Okay, and then in my, maybe my last one or two, just a level set is, I didn't see the breakout, but I didn't see that deck because I read the materials that were posted on Friday, if it was just posted. Does, does it show the ins and outs? In other words, are the employees, do they participate in this or is this simply an obligation of the city? So when you look at the liability, is there, uh, is it negative? Is it simply being run off or what's the pace at which this fund is being invaded by the need to provide the benefit? Mm -hmm. There are two, two prongs to it. Uh, we, we, when I talked about the valuation, uh, that's when uh, they would evaluate what is going to be the future cost for those 256 employees that we already have on the roster. So there would be things like life expectancy. If that increases, then our liability increases because we have to pay for them for longer because it's a monthly cost. Uh, at the same time, the discount rate is a big factor. The discount rate is currently 6.75%. Uh, we are expecting that that should go down to 6.5 to 6% in the long run. So that could add some, some more liability to, to us. Uh, so there are different factors at play. Uh, of course, the market returns have been great. So, so that has helped reduce some of the liability and uh, primarily cover us for not having contributed that amount that we were supposed to every year. Yeah, but we didn't participate because our money was in a drawer. Correct. Um, uh, and then I assume the last piece of it is healthcare cost inflation. That is true. Absolutely. So this is Martha, and this has been something we've talked about every year. And every year we have contributed some amount to, towards the liability. Now, what's interesting is we've contributed towards a fund, um, not necessarily, uh, we've contributed towards with a reserve, but didn't actually fund the liability. And it, it seems to me that by not funding the liability, we actually got a better rate of return than, than we would have otherwise. I mean, 10%, is that what you showed on the slide? An yes, annualized? So had we to have put this one and a half million four years ago, uh, we would have probably made 40% on it. So by keeping it in our books without transferring it to the fund, uh, we were investing it at probably less than half, uh, 50 basis points in our investment portfolio in the city. Yeah, so, so Martha, this is the old problem, right? The, that the, the investment report says, I think John will know this for sure. It's like 46 basis points against market, 70 something against cost only because we've ridden the curve down. And that's what this money yielded instead of confronting a six point something percent assumption and better yet when your money was actually exposed. So John, is it your opinion that, that we should we should fund this reserve? I mean, we should, yeah, we should fund the liability. Especially since we have the money on hand, it's not like we are trying to carve out new money for this. Uh, yeah. Just like how we, we suggested with the pension liability to, to pay down the 5 million, uh, it's a similar gain for us by, by putting this, first of all, we gain 6.75 on, on the valuation and on the other side, if, as the markets perform well, or, or we would get a market return that could be positive or negative, depending on the risk. That's why I talked about the three strategies that are available and uh, with the strategy one being the most risky. Yeah, but uh, my, my only slight pushback, I agree with all that, but John, I'm assuming that if we overfund this trust, we can't take any money back out. Once it's in, it's in. Uh, you can. In, in, in terms of OPEB, you can. Uh, in terms of pensions, you cannot. Okay. You can only use it to fund your pensions. And, and the, the benefit of the OPEB is whatever you fund into this fund, 
directly reduces your liability. Uh, it directly reduces on the balance sheet as well. Versus with the pension, if you set up a section 115 trust similar to this, it would not reduce your liability. It would be held like a reserve in your general fund. And this also plays into uh, the factor that when our uh, financials are, are looked at on its own, this 1.5 is not seen. So on the notes to the financial statements, it appears like we are only 56% funded. Whereas in reality, we are 96% funded, but unless it's in the trust, we can't really show that. So it helps with raising debt and any other thing that you may need in the future. I think there's a lot of reasons to pay it down, both both economic and, and appearance. And I, I think we should go ahead and pay it. I agree. Yeah, I agree too. Do you need I a motion? Agree. This is something that the city council has to decide on, but we can, we can recommend. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess my only straw man, having lived through a bunch of these, and we can fund it all the way in. I think I would just throw it out. Everybody can say, just put the money in. It's not much different. I think what most people would do is fund it at like the 85 or 90% level and, and stay on it each year because there's really no yeah. reward for getting in front of it. Um, yeah. But John, I'll defer. If left to my own druthers, I'd say fund it to 90% as soon as you have good data that says if that sucks up the whole million and a half, so be it. I probably wouldn't fund it beyond that because this money isn't needed for a really long time in the future. And then I think the discipline here that I'm kind of disappointed in is I would think you make an annual contribution to top that up and stay on it and not let it get behind you. But we don't want to just let the 1.5 million sail. I mean, the difference isn't very much money. It's just, it's usually not a place you get uh, ahead of yourself. And if, if I was the city trying to balance my risks, I'd, I'd love to be 85, 90% funded here and use any extra to get on the pension where we're nowhere near 85 or 90% um, funded. But, I'll, you know, John, kind of up to you. It's nickels and dimes relative to the problem. Yeah, Commissioner Richmond, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, when, when I say that we will be 96.5% funded after putting this 1.5 million, uh, the caveat there is that our valuation is three years old. Yeah. Uh, the new valuation is going to probably bring down the discount rate from 6.75 to six, six and a quarter. Uh, healthcare costs and uh, life expectancy could have gone up uh, and we, we really don't know how those factors will play until we have the valuation in hand. But at that point, I'm expecting it not to be 100% funded, but between 90 and 95%. So that would meet what you're saying. Yeah. I would move that we recommend the city council to pay it. Pay the, pay the 1.5? Yes. Yeah. Yep, I I could support that. I can support that. I can too. Yep. Do you want to call a roll call and do it officially? Yes, please. Uh, Wayne yes. Chair McClatchy. I agree with the motion. Commissioner Claris. I agree. Free. Uh, my name is Fry, by the way. Fry? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, Kalbach. Yes. Okay. Yes. Ripple? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. So then moving on to our next item, uh, we've got, uh, I believe it's the purchasing policy. And I did uh, put into the agenda the slides related to the changes requested by the committee. I'm going to try to pull that up. Thank 
I'm sorry, our next item is actually the investment policy, uh, is the investment report. Uh, were there any questions on the investment report? So can we move on? Because I don't think we need a word for that one. Okay. So can you see the the summaries of changes made? Uh, yes. What, what you can see right now? Yes. Okay. There you go. So uh, basically, I think we could continue with the discussion. Uh, I'm not sure if there were any further comments on the changes that were requested last time and those that were made versus any new changes before we get into uh, the discussion items on the last two here, which would be I believe on the la legal fees and land purchases that the city manager is going to take those questions. Uh, I just had those comments that I sent you for page four, paragraph nine. Okay. Any other members have questions on any other correction no. or requests? No. No. Okay, then I'll stop sharing this screen and I think I'll have the city manager take the floor to explain uh, his stand on the legal fees. Uh, so the, yeah, on, on the two items, the, the legal fees, one of the things uh, John and I looked at was um, not just how we budget for legal fees, but how we account for them um, and how we were doing it was not um, necessarily uh, the most transparent way we could have done it. Um, so we wanted to make changes to the purchasing policy that reflect um, sound financial practices, uh, legal budgeting practices, um, but also don't conflict with um, the idea that if you're showing um, someone who it, you're uh, in a court suit against or a lawsuit against the amount of money you're spending that may uh, kind of tip your hand on how invested you are in the case. So uh, the changes we made increase the transparency where, where people can actually see how much we're budgeting and spending on legal fees. And anytime we exceed that, council has to approve the change through uh, an increase in the, in the legal fund. Uh, what it does not do is go down to the granular level to say that on case A, we're spending X and on, on case Y, we're spending <laughs> the other amount. Um, and that the, the, um, the reason we didn't make the changes is we felt that um, recommending those changes to council would conflict with their current policy. Um, so we're happy to, to talk about that, that further, but I wanted to come back and just explain the reasoning for why uh, it's proposed the way it is. I guess the first question I have is how can we manage a budget if we don't know any detail about the budget? So I, I don't think um, looking at independent uh, or individual cases uh, hampers in any way the ability to manage the budget. Um, the amount that we budget for legal fees, uh, should that be exceeded, it has to go back to council. Uh, but these costs are, are um, being incurred uh, oftentimes through uh, legal advice uh, or closed session direction and discussion. So there's, there's not a way we can change that without um, conflicting with the current council policy. So I, I think there can be an element of there are other ways that it could be done, certainly, um, but the way we're proposing uh, is in line with council policy and is also in line with um, good financial practice. I can see the wheels turning in Tony's uh, head. Uh, Tony had some really interesting uh, points last time. 
No, it's, it's, it's okay with me. Look, here's, and you guys know this, right? The, 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 the friction John ran into is a, a, the result of a deeply felt belief by the members of this commission who've lived through it that, uh, the, and, and you guys get to prove us wrong and take us out of the valley of darkness here, but that the city was poorly managed and in particular the city did a terrible job of managing its risk portfolio, um, picking fights with people it shouldn't pick fights on, and then when it was in a fight, managing them poorly. And, you know, okay, we obviously got back to you. The pushback from us was, here's the biggest line item in effectively the P&L and the budget. And oh, by the way, it's one pot and we'll let you know if we overspent the pot, right? So from our perspective, from where, where we sit, that didn't sit very well. If it's something you guys can't manage around in terms of, of, uh, uh, of you see those other issues, then you got to run the city day to day. But all I guess we can do is burden you with, if we were to have the, the two hot button issues that have uh, predated your arrival, it's uh, how to manage the risk profile of a city that's in too many fights that it shouldn't be in and that are uh, uh, not appropriate for it. And the second one you heard the other part of, which is for the love of God, uh, take the money and pay down the pension liability. We've been talking about that as long as I've been on this commission, which is going on four years, which is why we sitting on 46 basis point money and be in charge six or 7% of it while we watch the, those obligations go. So, you know, John, those are, you're now burdened with both barrels of what we spent most <laughs> of our time. And, you know, all of us, me included, had more hair and more molar surface uh, than we did four <laughs> years ago, because um, both those issues are kind of under our skin of things that ha have been uh, running around. And, you know, to use, you know, my favorite term, but just neither of them been managed, right? And they both need to be managed because uh, they're the two biggest liabilities the city's chasing right now, the unfunded darn pension and a uh, pool of cases that a city this size just shouldn't have a portfolio of cases. It looks like this. It needs to be managed back to a place that's appropriate for uh, sleepy little Los Altos. John, I don't know if I hit my marks or not. That's my you know, reaction to it tonight. I'm sorry to impose it on the relatively new city manager and finance manager, but you're, you're burdened by what's bothering us. Well said. I'm not sure if the members of the public have raised their hand to speak on this item or was it for the only item? So I, see, I, I do see two hands uh, raised. They may be old, the original hands up. They John, I put those down. For, sorry, Gary. I think those were for the initial public comment. Yeah. I'm going to lower those hands. Uh, if they need to speak again on this item, they can raise their hand. And then with, the second point was with, with regards to a land purchase policy. Uh, we did talk about that internally, uh, city manager, me and deputy city manager, and uh, we kind of felt that the purchasing policy per se should be more of an operating document, uh, but that doesn't preclude this committee from requesting or directing their desire to have a land policy. I think the, the purchasing policy should reflect our, our um, financial practices, as well as uh, council policy, um, state, federal, uh, any applicable laws. Uh, land purchasing policy uh, is a policy decision for the city council. Should they uh, decide they, they want to have one, they can direct staff uh, and then we can bring it back. Um, and it's, I, I'm, I'm not high or low on a land purchasing policy. Um, I, I just think the, the purchasing policy itself is probably not where that concept lives at. I don't disagree with that in the sense purchasing policy and land is going to be different. Um, one of the reasons I'm asking the question is we do need a policy for purchasing land and a vehicle so that it can occur. Um, 
there are periods of time when it becomes very feasible and uh, we should we should actually do it. And the overburdened city council, I don't think is in a, in a great position to go out, find the land and direct um, individuals of staff to vet it and then go through parks and recreation. There needs to be some sort of vehicle for it. We need a vehicle for donating land and a way to donate land. Um, there would be very advantageous ways that we can make it for citizens to accept, uh, to want to donate because um, we have the requirement of having more uh, parks uh, in that. So what I'm looking for is to start a procedure where we can actually identify land uh, when city council has deemed that, yes, we'd like some more parks and rec land. It, so again, I think if, if council wants to make that a policy direction, they, they can give that to staff and we can bring back a, a land purchasing policy. I, I, again, I'm not saying it's a, a bad idea. I'm, I'm just saying council has to give that direction. Okay. Um, and then that's where it would come from. I think we have one hand raised. Uh, should we wait for the discussion to be complete before we let the speaker in? Were there any other comments on, on the purchasing policy before I let the public comment? Not from me. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let Roberta speak. Uh, Roberta, you can take three minutes. Roberta? You're on mute, Roberta. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great, great. You were just talking about a land purchasing policy, and I didn't know if that included uh, the sale of land or the lease of land and what policies we have in relationship to that. Because often in the past, we've had people, you know, coming to us wanting to use our land. Uh, I know that now the state has a surplus land act uh, where if we're going to sell land, it needs to be offered up for housing first. And I thought that that would be something that, you know, if you're going to you know, be going to council or Mr. England is going to council. Not only, you know, use sales, land, uh, you know, leases, agreements, you know, who gets priority? You know, how do we determine the, the value of the land? I think those are all really important questions that many, many residents are concerned about. So I'm glad you're talking about it and starting the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Would the commission like to move to take a vote on the, moving the purchasing policy to council? Yeah, having having heard the assurance that the legal line will be smaller in the next fiscal year, I'm happy to approve this. <laughs> Second. Awesome. Vice Chair McClatchy? Yes. Commissioners Claris? Yes. Fry? I think you're on mute. But I did read your You're on mute, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Kalwak? Yes. Richmond? Yes. Whipple? Yes. That motion passes six to zero as well. So moving on to uh, a little discussion on continued discussion on the financial system. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and the city manager would like to kick off uh, this one. All right, so uh, picking up on the, the presentation that uh, John gave last time, we, we wanted to talk about uh, where we're at in the, the current financial uh, system, um, what we think the next steps are, uh, and why we want to move forward. 
for me, the, the reason I wanted to come back tonight is the, the decision in our financial system is kind of emblematic of how we've made decisions as a, as a city here. So we have um, kind of this Frankenstein system uh, that doesn't really work well together that, that we've grafted on um, that we have to do a lot of things manually with. Um, but overall, it's not just less effective, but in, in the long run, even really the, the, the short run, it's also more expensive to operate less effectively. Um, and it's funny, last, at the last meeting, we had uh, a long discussion about ADP and if it met the needs or not. Uh, and the day after the, that finance commission meeting, we got a letter from CalPERS that said, um, we've been misreporting um, payroll for a large number of employees since 2016. Um, and we essentially have to go back and manually uh, enter it back through our system. Had that email come the day before the conversation, this commission would have had kind of real life examples of, of what we're trying to do. Um, so when we look at how we operate, having an enterprise system um, is crucial. You know, right now, um, what, or actually before I started, uh, the vice mayor, uh, who's your liaison at the time said, hey, here are the, here are the information we wanna get to the, the finance commission on a regular basis. And I said, that's so simple. Um, <laughs> we, can, we can provide this, you know, we're not trying to be obstinate. And then when I got here, um, I tried to pull a number for what, what is the cost of a fully burdened employee. Um, and I got one number from finance. I got a second number that was different from HR. I got a third number that was different from Ide Bailey, our uh, contract finance consultant. And then I was like, oh, I'll just do it myself. And I pulled a fourth number. Um, so our systems, is, it's not just that they don't talk. It's that they're actually tracking different things that we use to make decisions on. And we're at a point right now where it's one thing to make decisions on what is imperfect data. It's an entirely different thing to make decisions on bad data knowingly. Um, so what we asked, uh, what we thought we heard the ask was, was to come back with um, kind of a cost analysis and then also look at what the other cities are using. And we'll let John talk through that. Um, but one of the most telling things for me was not only seeing what all the other governments, what all our other peers use, but the system that we use is they're no longer even bidding on RFPs because they know they're not a competitive product. Um, having said that, I'll turn it over to John and, and let him walk you through the analysis. So what was attached in the staff report was primarily which systems are being used by uh, different cities in the Bay Area. Uh, if you would see there, uh, most of the cities that use the Central Square software or some variant of, of their software are moving away from them to, with the latest being our neighbors, Los Gatos, uh, they have the similar system as us and they have uh, already signed to move away from uh, Central Square to Tyler. Now, in terms of... Uh, <clears throat> the analysis here, the, I picked up this uh, from Melno Park. Uh, they recently had their staff report out uh, comparing different systems uh, for and uh, going with a new RFP. Uh, this is approximately what, <coughs> sorry, what, what a system would cost us. Uh, an implementation would be around $330,000 to $335,000 with a recurring cost of ninety-seven dollars or $98,000, a little under $100,000 for total implementation and one first year subscription of $430,000. Ideally, these are three year uh, scenarios. So you would have here, I'm computing an 861 three year cost if this was a new system. Then moving down here, uh, what are we currently paying? We're paying close to 202,000 to perform the functions that this new system would provide us, which means uh, we are overpaying over 100,000 per year in annual cost. So 
if I flip all of that down here. Was there a question or? Okay, hey John, when you call it a, a annual cost, does that mean it's a real license fee cash out the door? Or are Correct. you saying it takes too many people or real cash out the door? So this 202,000 is real cash out of the door uh, because these, this is what we pay to use these two systems. And then we also pay consultants around 40,000 to produce some of the reports uh, every year that would come out from here. Uh, one example would be the gas tax report, the street report, uh, parts of the annual uh, compensation report that we use consultants for because that data is not intuitively available from the system. Whereas a, a good ERP system, whichever I've used in the past, that is well, that has been implemented across governments in California would produce a lot of those reports. And besides all of this, you also have the additional staff time citywide, especially because budget is in Excel. There are Excel sheets uh, moving all around the city. Uh, people have to complete those and then someone has to compile that. I would estimate, if I estimate 100,000 in wasted staff resources, that's an understatement. I, I think I've seen more Excel worksheets here than I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and, and I can't find two Excel worksheets that give me the same number. So that's a little frightening for me. But in any case, I, if I look at a five year, assuming we, we, we invested in a new system, our initial outflow would be that 228,000 initially, but then you have a payback throughout. So over a five year period with the current setup, we would be spending almost a million 100. After implementing and having a new system in five years, we would actually make $250,000. And those are the, the, the red line here is showing you how much it costs us to operate our current system and then how much the new system would cost. And it is going to cost us less uh, depending, of course, this depends on what system we get. Uh, these are average systems that are workable for a city of our size. Uh, if we go for something like Oracle or SAP, which are high end, those implement implementation costs would be maybe 10 times this amount. So uh, that's much more higher. Can I ask you a question, John? Um, what's included in that uh, ADP figure? Because that comes out to $900 per employee. It seems kind of high. It is pretty high. It is high. I have to go back and see the, the contract because they process, they do everything for us. Uh, assuming that we had our own system. So, so this is what, what really doesn't make monetary sense to me is that we do have an in-house full-time payroll person. That is, and then we have a whole HR team that does all the updates in ADP, whereas ADP just processes the payroll. The two additional things they do for us would be a quarterly tax filing and the year-end W-2s, which could naturally be done in your own system as well. It just seems, it, it just seems very high. I mean, and perhaps government is radically different, but in my company, the cost per employee is a small fraction of that. Yeah. I, I think it's because of having to build those special codes for government. Uh, it is, and, and we can't build those codes. I actually had a meeting with ADP asking them, can I build my own codes in your system? And they said, no, that is work that we have to do at our end. Since that's a, the major driver of all of your analysis, I personally would like to see more detail on that ADP number. And I would love to have an ADP representative explain why they're unable to do what you want them to do. Um, my experience in the past with ADP is, and we're a sm much smaller organization, they've been over backwards for us and virtually anything 
whether if we wanted to go to a job cost system or projectization, they had some nice systems for that. Um, Art, you, you've, yep. you've done a lot with ADP. Why don't you talk? Uh, so I'm in the same place with you. I find this astonishing. I've, I've probably been a CFO for the last 30 years in, in small technology companies in the Valley. And uh, every one of those companies has been, has had uh, ADP as its payroll system. Now, none of those people have unionized employees and very little overtime and things of that sort. So it may be that it's much more confusing, but I'm, I'm amazed at the cost as well. It just seems, you know, almost an order of magnitude too high. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm seeing too. I mean, if we had that type of figure with ADP, we would have gotten ADP rid of ADP years ago. Yeah. And we've had ADP for 30 years and I can't even remember an error they made. Um, well, I think they make errors when the payroll people make errors. When the, when the payroll clerks or the, the accountants inside the organization don't know what they're doing with ADP, it can be very ugly. Uh, so you do need uh, critical skills there uh, to be able to work inside the ADP system to make it deliver what you want. But if we've been doing something wrong since 2016, um, you know, ADP should have told us uh, something because that's that's crazy. Well, it's not, and, and for clarity, that wouldn't be a ADP's responsibility, and that's how it's how we reported to Calpers. So. In government, if you have four employees in the city of Los Altos making the same hourly rate, they could belong to three different unions or be unrepresented, sure. out and represented. They could have two different um, pension and benefit options. Uh, they could have different times when uh, they end or start reporting uh, to CalPERS, right? They could have different union dues coming out. So we have to build all that to put it into ADP because again, it's not, it's not pulling the information from the system. So the error uh, in this case uh, was most likely happened. Uh, we made an error in 2016 uh, and then we replicated that error every day. <laughs> that's right. Cause, uh, cause that's the key is when you set somebody up and you decide uh, yeah. so no, you, that's more complicated than it is in industry, but even in industry, you have, you know, which, uh, which health plan did you sign up for and are you getting stock options and, right. and uh, all of the other things that you have to do, what's your share of the health benefits and yada, yada, that all has to be set up. And then once it's set up, it runs. And if it's wrong, uh, well, at least with ADP, you never screw up with the state or the feds because they're careful that you uh, you do that. But I can absolutely believe that you could get something set up where somebody like a CalPERS would, would not understand, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't agree with what ADP was doing because it's a different, different use of the data. But that to me sounds more like an auditing issue rather than a ADP issue. Correct me yep. if I'm wrong. Again, so I'm not saying that's an ADP issue. I'm saying that we had to build a, uh, manually to feed it into ADP yeah. as opposed to being part of the enterprise system. So there were multiple mistakes made dating back to 2016 by people here and how they were reported into ADP. So I'm not placing blame on ADP for not catching that. Yeah. I'm simply saying that a, a system that pulls information uh, instead of having it pushed to it and entered manually would be a better system. Yeah. Uh, I would so still it doesn't uh, have highly to. encourage that we have an ADP representative visit with us since they are the main cost drivers for this entire plan. So I, I, I don't think uh, ADP is the main cost driver for this plan. We have to put it back up. I, what was the annual cost on it? It was 202,000. 120K. Yeah. 120,000 is what we pay ADP. Uh, to me, Yes, that cost is one thing, but then in terms of the the primary issue we have, I believe, in the city is with the budget, you know, computing budget in Excel. Now, 80% or 70% of your cost on your operating budget is personnel. Uh, having that within your own ERP then makes your personnel budgeting simpler to do within one ERP system versus having ADP separate. And then considering that that 120 cost was what we are paying, it made a lot more sense that we do it ourselves in-house. 
Yeah, I still don't buy that. I'm with the other guys. ADP is the gold standard. Most companies have an enterprise system not built on ADP. They just feed the payroll into whatever they've got, and then they've got an automated reporting system. Um, but I would go further. I would ask the HR department to come forward and see if, if they have problems with ADP or if they have problems with, with uh, dumping ADP. So uh, human resources was the one that initiated the discussion, um, but we're, we're happy to have uh, the conversation uh, with them as well. So uh, again, I, I'm not saying this is an ADP issue. Uh, we, we can graft systems onto an, onto an enterprise system. Um, the, the system we have, if I understand it correctly, right now has issues talking with ADP. So if a ADP could still be a very good payroll system if it talks to your financial system. Uh, and the last conversation, and I, I guess John can explain it better, but the last conversation I saw, our, our didn't our financial system say that they, they weren't able to integrate yet? Yes, they, they cannot, uh, finance enterprise is not ready for, for an integration with ADP. Uh, other systems are uh, that, we, that we have looked at, they, they have already got connections with some of the other financial systems that we saw on that list. I would still like Can to I? have these software vendors uh, come visit our uh, commission and explain to us why that doesn't work because it makes no sense to me why a ERP system would not be able to integrate with ADP, the largest payroll company in the country. So it is not an ADP problem. Uh, it is a finance enterprise problem. Uh, they They would have to do that and they don't have the resources at this time and it would be additional cost. John, do you have any back perspective back? on why the previous administration had been so committed to the previous engine and representing to the commission that uh, this was a move towards automation and less manual entry and no Excel budgeting, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, everything you're saying is the opposite of what your predecessor told us for four years. Yeah, so we, we would be speculating, obviously, as you know, John and I were not here. I, I do think a lot of times vendors are very good uh, at talking about what their product will be able to eventually do uh, versus what it, what it can do or how they can integrate it. Um, I will say the, the decision is not out of line with I, how I've seen this organization make other decisions. Um, we, we didn't get uh, the system that was most common or easiest to integrate with or met all of our needs. We got a system that we could get in place cheaply um, and then we would then uh, try and um, customize to meet our needs as opposed to, to buying a, an enterprise system. So. I don't want to speculate on what um, the previous finance director uh, was told. We, we weren't there. We, we can say how it operates now is not good. And the company, uh, as far as we've seen the last couple of RFPs, the company we have is not put even responding to RFPs for financial systems. Um, we're, again, it's speculation, but we're assuming they recognize their, their product um, is not competitive in the marketplace at this time. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Mark, I, I think it's, you, you worded the question well and Gabe answered it well, appropriately. I, I'm personally disappointed that we spent $150,000 to bring us up to the latest, greatest integrated system on the IT roadmap. Uh, I'm not even sure we had an IT roadmap two years ago. Uh, and uh, do we now, and does this, I mean, you're not proposing a system as opposed to looking at a new system. Is that correct, John? We are, we, we have uh, produced a list of what's popular in the market right now. Uh, okay. within, within our ability or, or for our size of city, 
And I yeah. think the choice would be just three systems that could provide that. Uh, and I also looked at what Melo Park did recently. Uh, they have actually gone for OpenGov, but it's a little more risky in terms of that's a developing system as well. They, they've, uh, they're trying to get something together and Melo Park is helping them uh, in that process. So your, your spec sheet now as you're looking and have looked, are looking at three likely systems are you starting to evaluate them or finishing evaluation? Are you going to come back to this commission next time or sometime and say, I recommend that you look at one? I believe that I'm is putting words in your mouth. Abu, do you want to take that? <laughs> I, I wanted to see. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to see what we were about to do. So I, I think right now we wanted to see what's in the marketplace. We wanted to to complete the analysis of, of what we've had, what we need. At this point, we just kind of want to make the commission and council aware there, there's a problem. We're going to need to move on it. Um, we don't know if that is RFP a new system. We don't know if that is um, look at where it's been bid already in the marketplace and, and piggyback off that contract and negotiate directly. At this point, we're just trying to have a conversation follow, following up on, on what we heard last time. We're going to talk with the city of council about it in, in very general terms, um, I think, at, at um, goal setting at the retreat. Um, so at this point, we're, we're just letting people know what, what we find, talking with commissions about what we found. And then once we have a plan together, we'll, we'll come back. Okay, that's fair. I, I, I just expressed my disappointment in being hoodwinked or sold something that we don't have. But that's not your problem. Your problem is to solve it. I guess that Change invites it. the question, how do we know we're not going to get hoodwinked again? Because we have two new folks there. <laughs> well, I, I think when, when we look at when we look at what the needs of the city are, what it, what it takes to operate as a modern government, there, there's a handful of providers that can do that. I don't think what you're going to see us recommend is taking a chance on a company where we're the only one out of 85 cities in the Bay Area to use it. We're not going to take a chance on a company that says we can't integrate with your payroll now, but we're working on it. We think we're going to be able to integrate in 24 months. Right? We're going to get a system that, that meets the needs we have. There's a handful that do it, um, and, and we'll come back when when we have that done i think for me the it's it's upsetting to spend the hundred fifty thousand, but it's actually that we're spending more money annually um while we're not being efficient it's also frustrating for me because it's it's a recognized issue that we have each year at budget and we just keep moving keep moving it forward and say well you know we'll deal with it next time so i, I think can I, can I, we'll come back, we'll, john will come back with with a plan and that, then we'll see how the commission yeah. feels about it can I just ask one specific question on the Excel spreadsheet for budgeting? Are you trying to eliminate that or integrate it or you don't want to have 25 Excel spreadsheets around the city two years from now? I, I've, I have never seen as many Excel spreadsheets that count just specific things at, at one point in my life. <laughs> it's so much. John's, John's doing a disservice. You should see just how many Excels we have for everything, but none of them tie together. We don't update them. Um, and even trying to get, to get budget numbers out when I first started, um, we pulled up and we got the number and then the analyst says, wait, I forgot. That's not the spreadsheet we went with. And she pulled up another one. <laughs> it was a different number. So I'm just, I'm just not sure how we're operating. Yeah, and I can't figure out the CIP till now. Uh, I can't tie it up, which is really frustrating. You know, things I'm used to getting done in an hour is taking me weeks to, to find out where that real number is because the system's so convoluted. Uh, ideally, the way I would like to see a system work is everything is in the financial system. Uh, people are able to update their budgets within the financial system. Uh, the CIP is run within the financial system. And then as well as 
the reporting and everything else comes out immediately from there. So if you're using Excel, it's to pull good data and manipulate it into a report, if at all. But everything should reside in the system. Right now, is we work backwards, we work Excel worksheets and push that into the system. Yeah, that's not good. So, okay, glad you're here. Glad you're working on it. Any more comments on this before we move to, I believe, what will be the last item of the day? I'm I'm done. I, I'm interested to see what you're going to recommend at some point. Obviously, I guess my comment is uh, we in the city, nobody can actually operate if we don't have good, good current and okay. uh, quickly available data. If, we, if our systems can't do that, we need to make them better. Yep. That, that's, the, that's the issue that I'm facing right now uh, in terms of even ADP is it, it's working. We, right now, we still have to use a third party consultant to convert the ADP data into a uploadable version for the new system. And even once that's done, it can only go to one fund. So for example, if our plan going forward is to bring to this committee a new process on how we uh, charge personnel. So it, right now we do everything in the general fund, but then we are possibly you know, giving a break to our enterprise funds, like let's say the sewer fund, even though I work on it, I don't charge to it. So I want to have staff to have the ability to be able to charge to multiple funding sources. Uh, even when we have the CIP, you know, a lot of the CIP would be funded by grants or be funded by uh, the gas tax and stuff like that. And I would like the engineers who are working on those funds to be able to charge directly to a CIP. So we are not burdening everything on the general fund. That way we could free more resources. Of course, that's coming up in terms of what direction we want to take and how Gabe and me talk about, the city manager and me talk about moving forward, but we need the right tools to be able to implement all of this. Okay. So no, no vote from the council tonight. They're just, uh, they're just Correct. informing us, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. So moving to the last item, uh, we need to be approving a calendar for the coming uh, finance uh, coming calendar year. Uh, so I'm going to. I don't know if I should really share the screen, but let me do that. So. We have two dates here uh, in January 17th and the February 21st, which are Martin Luther and President's Day. So uh, I would like to get a consensus on whether we should move these dates a week earlier, a week later, a day before, a day after. What, what would this commission prefer? So that they don't become special meetings going forward because we, we would have them set on our calendar so they would be regular meetings. Hey, hey Gary, haven't we traditionally pushed them one week behind? One week is what I remember, yeah. Uh, as, as do I. I. That doesn't mean we have to yes. do it. I just want to burden John with what I think the practice was, which if yeah. it was a holiday yeah. Monday, we pushed one week behind. Yeah. That seems very logical. Okay. So, so the, the committee would be open to, to moving January 17 a week earlier, February 21st a week earlier. No, a week later. Week later. Later? Later. Week later. Week later. 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 Okay. Week later. Week later. Okay, behind. Okay, I took that wrong. Yeah. So, so January 24 and February 28. Okay, so I'll have that uh, on the minutes. And with regards to the other dates, are they all okay for everybody? Is there any other date during the year that uh, the members would feel needs to be changed? They're all fine for me. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. And then the last thing would be uh, our next meeting is on December 20th. Uh, would that 
Not for everybody, would we have Purim or would it be too close to Christmas? It's fine with me. Fine with me. Okay. I'm fine with it. Right. As long as it's remote, it'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you send that in a uh, calendar update? Yes. I think that, that's the way the calendar exists right now, right? That you set out before? Correct. So I will amend those two dates because the calendar update that I send everybody is uh, the third Monday of every uh, every month. Yeah. So for these two, I'll change those dates and, and post this into the meeting agenda. Yeah. Okay. And finally, any uh, on the staff staff reports. Uh, I was supposed to take the CalPERS uh, prefund, uh, 5 million prefunding to council last week, but uh, because there was a backlog on the agenda, I'm taking it on November 30th. Uh, the intention is still to have that money go out of the door before the end of the year. Uh, possibly with the OPEB also going, if not towards the end of the year, at least in early January depending on when we can take that to council as well. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we, I believe we can adjourn. Would the vice chair adjourn the meeting? Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good okay. job, John. Thank you. Thank All right, you. good night. See you soon. All right.